You're listening to an Ono Media podcast. Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise and Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and this carjacking case out of Central Florida just keeps getting weirder. 31-year-old Catherine Altagracia Guerrero de Aguas Villas was in the left turn lane at an intersection in Seminole County just two weeks ago when an older model green Acura pulled up behind her. The Acura had been following Catherine and had also rammed the back of her white Dodge Durango several times, and she was terrified. She was three hours from her home in an unfamiliar place. She called her husband, Miguel, for help, truly unsure of how to stay Stay safe. And Miguel's not near. He's back home, nearly 300 miles away. He instructed her to not stop the car. But just moments later, she found herself at that stoplight in the left hand turn lane. And that's when a man wearing a Halloween mask jumped out of the green Acura carrying a large automatic weapon. He points the weapon at the driver's side window of the white Dodge, then jumps into the back seat. The whole encounter at the stoplight was caught on video by the driver of the car that had pulled up behind the Acura. Now, when the light turns green, Catherine flips a U-turn and the green Acura follows. A 911 call placed by the driver, who filmed the whole carjacking and kidnapping of the incident, has been released. Here, just give that 911 call a listen. 911, do you need police, fire, or medical? Uh, I don't need anything, but there's a guy going down East Lake Drive in Seminole County. With uh, He was chasing the car, hit the car, got out of his car with a hood over his face and had a machine gun and got the guy to open the door and was pointing the, door, the gun at him. And then he got in the back seat of the car and then the car that was chasing them did a U-turn and they went back towards 1792. I've got some video of it, but... You need to do something now because I don't know what's going on. Now, I'm going to pause the story right here. Catherine is scared. She's been rammed by the Acura. She calls her husband, Miguel, but neither one of them call 911. You've been hit by another car and no one calls 911 except a bystander. And the advice that your husband gives you is don't get out of the car. And then he doesn't check in on you for two hours because that's what happened next. He didn't call police. She is carjacked and he doesn't inform anyone that he hasn't heard from his wife for two hours since she called him terrified about the behavior of the men driving the green Acura. And then her white Dodge. Well, it's found burning 17 miles from the intersection where the carjacking was caught on tape. Now inside the burning SUV, was a badly charred body that investigators rightly assumed was Catherine Guerrero de Aguas Villas. Also, all around the Dodge, investigators found a dozen shell casings consistent with the type of 10 millimeter handgun that Catherine's kidnapper was shoving through the driver's side window. Miguel, after several hours, has been connected with the Seminole County Sheriff, Dennis Lima, and he tells the sheriff that Catherine was traveling through Central Florida to visit family. Except that doesn't check out. She doesn't appear to have family in that area. The two immigrated to the U.S. from the Dominican Republic five years ago, and they are associated with two South Florida businesses, a barber shop and a beauty salon. Also, neither one has a criminal history, which leads police to believe they aren't living a high-risk lifestyle, at least on the surface. So why Catherine? Why is she in Central Florida, and why was she abducted and murdered? Well, we have just a few of the answers. On Friday, the man who police believe carried out the attack was arrested. 28-year-old Jordanish Torres Garcias was taken into custody on other unrelated charges, but police do believe he is the man who was wearing the Halloween mask. They say his Facebook profile picture shows him wearing the identical sweatshirt that he is seen wearing in the video filmed by the driver of the car that was behind the Acura. Torres Garcia is also linked to that green Acura. And apparently, Torres Garcia is wanted in Puerto Rico on gun charges, and that's how police detained him in Seminole County. But they still haven't made any connections between Catherine and Torres Garcia that are truly solid. 
All right, so we have Torres Garcia in jail as the sheriff's office investigates. And they've also named Giovanni Crespo Hernandez as a person of interest. Catherine had FaceTimed Hernandez shortly before she was murdered. And the sheriff's office believes he has information about what went down that day. Police say Hernandez, who's been reported to be involved in a central Florida drug ring, allegedly told Catherine's brother that she wasn't in the Orlando area to visit family. Hernandez allegedly said she was there to deliver money and quote, other stuff to a friend. Investigators raided Hernandez's home where they found fentanyl and firearms, but they didn't find Hernandez. He's on the run. They did find Hernandez's girlfriend though, and she was taken into custody during a sting operation on Friday, where she accepted a delivery of three kilos of cocaine. Now the sting was orchestrated by Homeland Security and they found not only the drugs, but they also found thousands of dollars, drug ledgers, multiple cell phones and high value stolen jewelry. Hernandez was previously involved in a 2020 drug investigation that ended with over $330,000 being seized. He is also named as a person of interest in several home invasions and homicides. So police obviously think this guy is a bad dude. Hernandez's girlfriend was released on $15,000 bond. And I can't help but think this might be so the sheriff's office can watch her closely and hope that she leads them to Hernandez. Now the sheriff's office says they are still searching for two other individuals, one of which is the person who was driving the Acura at the time of the abduction, and then some other person. And further complicating this case, Orange County Deputy Francisco Estrella. Okay, this is a man that it isn't even in Seminole County. This is in Orange County, so South Florida. Well, this deputy, Francisco Estrella, he is a family friend of Miguel. He's accused of providing Miguel with details about the investigation. Now, those details include the home address of the lead detective and videos of the investigation. Deputy Estrella had contacted the Seminole Sheriff's Office several times, claiming his last name was Archula and that he was actually the cousin of Catherine's. He was trying to get information about the case, and then he would allegedly provide that information to Miguel via WhatsApp. When the sheriff's office discovered the falsified name and they figured out who Estrella actually was, they arrested him on charges of interception of wire, oral, or electronic communication, disclosure of wire, oral, or electronic communication, disclosure or use of confidential criminal justice information, and accessing computer or electronic devices without authorization. He is being held on an $18,000 bond. And then there's this additional wrinkle to the investigation. The day before Catherine was abducted and killed, a tow truck driver was also gunned down in Seminole County and 10 millimeter shell casings were found at the scene. But not just a couple of shell casings, over 100 rounds had been fired. And Sheriff Lima states that 10 millimeter rounds are not commonly found at shootings in the area. 39-year-old Juan Luis Cintron Garcia was found wounded at the scene of the shooting. After being transported to the hospital, he died from those gunshot wounds. The sheriff's office said they believe this to be a targeted attack and that it could be related to Catherine's murder because the tow truck driver had towed that green Acura a month prior. And that same green Acura was reported by witnesses to be near the scene of the tow truck driver shooting. Now, despite Miguel not being a suspect at this time, investigators do believe he's not being completely transparent about his knowledge of what was occurring that day. Sheriff Lima has told media outlets that the initial story of Catherine being up there to visit family members seems to be inaccurate. He said that he thinks there are a lot more planks that Miguel could help fill in about the circumstances involving the death of his wife and also about other potential crimes. Another thing, her route on that fateful day has been confusing as well. She left her home just after noon and traveled north to Seminole County. She stopped to pump gas at a shell station off Interstate 4, and then she started using back roads. She weaved her way towards the Winter Springs area on these back roads, and that's when she noticed the green Acura following her. 
We have fewer unanswered questions at this point than answered questions in this case. So I'll keep tabs. But Catherine's father told WESH in Orlando that Catherine was the mother to a six-year-old daughter and that while she was in Santo Domingo, she studied English and graduated from the university there when she was 21 years old. He described his daughter as someone with friends who was well-behaved. He then implored those who would be hearing his comments about his daughter to cooperate with law enforcement if they know anything about the kidnapping and murder. He said, today it was his daughter, but tomorrow it could be your daughter or someone else you love. And now to Indiana, where a mother admitted to smothering her child, yet she will not face any prison time for that murder. Dacia Lacey had given birth to her third child in the summer of 2022. The baby girl named Alana was being raised by both mother and father, but the two were not in a relationship. When Alana was two months old, Dacia called 911, reporting her baby was not breathing. When help arrived, EMTs determined Alana had died. The Indianapolis police questioned Dacia, and she told investigators that she had placed the infant on the couch and then left her other young children in the room with Alana. According to the affidavit, Dacia stated she went to prepare food for her and the children, and she was also gathering up laundry to make a visit to the laundromat. Dacia told investigators when she re-entered the room, she noticed that Alana was under a blanket and a pillow, and when she uncovered the infant, she could tell the child was not breathing. Dacia said she asked her three-year-old daughter what had happened and that the toddler began crying. Dacia then told detectives she wasn't sure what had happened, but she knew it was an accident. Well, all of this did appear to be an unfortunate accident until a few days after Alana died. That's when the girlfriend of Alana's father was watching the three-year-old. The girlfriend told investigators that the three-year-old made a spontaneous statement about the death. The girl said her mother put a pillow over Alana's face because she was crying. Now, investigators did take the matter seriously, and when they interviewed the three-year-old, not enough substantial information was discovered. By this time, the autopsy of little Alana had been completed, but it also did not yield definitive information. It eventually ruled that the cause of death was undetermined. But then, three weeks after Alana's death, Dacia's drug screen came back. Dacia had meth in her system on the day Alana died. Finally, in January of 2023, five months after Alana's death, Dacia held another meeting with investigators. But this time, she allegedly admitted that she had taken a rolling pill, which she thought was Molly, but she claimed the pill actually contained meth. She also said she took the pill a few days before Alana's death when she was out with friends for a night of fun. She said on the day of the death, she was still high and that she was frustrated with Alana crying. The affidavit states that Dacia told investigators that she forcefully rubbed lotion on Alana's back, trying to get her to stop crying. She then said she told the baby to shut up. Dacia said she picked up the baby and forcefully repeated, Alana, be quiet, be quiet. The affidavit states that Dacia said she then placed the baby face down between the couch cushions and then Dacia went to sleep. She told investigators she never put pressure on Alana and that she didn't mean for it to happen. She claimed everything was an accident because she was so high. It was on that day in January when cops arrested her and charged her with neglect of a dependent resulting in death. Well, last week, Dacia faced a bench trial, so that's one where the judge would determine her guilt or innocence, not a jury. Well, it wasn't a long trial. Three days of investigators testifying, there was some back and forth about the autopsy, but in the end, Judge Mark Stoner found Dacia not guilty. Here, you can listen to the verdict. Court accordingly enters judgment of not guilty, reluctantly. I do hope that you all take the opportunity to get the counseling that you need, to get the counseling for the children that you need, that you learn from this behavior and hopefully the rest of the community learns from this behavior, that you cannot go out and party on the weekend and be with children. Now, Judge Stoner then went on to tell Dacia that she wasn't innocent, 
but also that she wasn't guilty of what the state had charged her with. He chalked up the death to bad judgment. He said the following, This is a case that happens when you're a bad parent. There are some things you can never do. You can never have sole possession of your children and then go out and use drugs. Now, Judge Stoner said one reason he found Dacia innocent was because she did not have a history of abuse. There was not evidence showing extended aggression or evidence of previous abuse like broken bones. He then said that not everything that is a mistake is criminal. He said the mistake had to be done with criminal intent or criminal responsibility. And the state charged her with criminal intent. He said the state did not prove criminal intent and that poor parenting does not equate to criminal intent. So if you're losing your mind right now about this decision, understand that this isn't the first time Judge Mark Stoner has made headlines from the bench. Back in April of 2020, four Indianapolis police officers had responded to a disturbance call at an apartment complex. As officers approached the door to the apartment, a male officer knocked on the door and requested entrance. That's when 27-year-old Elias Dorsey opened fire. He shot and killed Metropolitan Police Department officer Breanne Leith when two bullets fired by Dorsey through the door struck Breanne in the head. Now, during the melee, Dorsey's girlfriend tried to flee from the apartment. Dorsey shot her also, but she did survive the attack. Dorsey was charged with murder, criminal confinement while armed with a deadly weapon, battery, and four counts of attempted murder for the four officers standing outside of the third floor apartment door. It took four years for Dorsey's murder trial to finally reach a courtroom. And in February of this year, after seven days of testimony and 14 hours of deliberation, the jury found Dorsey guilty of murder. But that guilty finding, it has this little extra to it. It's called guilty of murder but mentally ill at the time of the incident. Okay, the jury came to that conclusion because of all of the evidence that was shown that Dorsey just had a history of mental illness. Well, the jury also found Dorsey guilty of reckless attempted homicide for the shooting of his girlfriend. Okay, at the time, back in February of this year, the prosecutor's office was satisfied with the jury's finding. The prosecutor told WTHR that a conviction of guilty but mentally ill does require a sentence in prison. And Brianne's mother told WTHR that she was satisfied with the verdict because all she wanted was for Dorsey to serve prison time for the death of her daughter. But then, in early April, so just a couple of weeks ago, Judge Mark Stoner sentenced Dorsey to time served for the shooting death of MPD officer Brianne Leith. He then sentenced Dorsey to 40 years for the attempted murder of his girlfriend, but Judge Stoner also suspended 15 of those years. All right, so let's catch up here. So for the death of Officer Leith, Dorsey got time served, which was about four years. And then for attempting to shoot his girlfriend, he'll serve for 25 years. Judge Stoner also ordered 15 years of mental health probation when Dorsey is released from prison. Now, understandably, the family of Breanne Leith was rocked by the sentencing, but so was the police department and the prosecutor's office. Rick Snyder, he's the president of the Indianapolis Fraternal Order of Police, said in a statement that this is why officers in the city of Indianapolis are fleeing this community. The statement also read that law enforcement can't stand by and watch what is being done to the city. It's being torn apart by the criminal justice system that is supposed to be protecting it. Snyder then said officers are choosing to go to other communities to be able to protect and serve there because there's no hope here. Well, Jennifer, remember that's Brianne's mom. She said that she was glad that Dorsey will serve some time in prison, but that she felt like Judge Stoner basically told the residents of the city that you can assault officers or anybody for that matter, and then go on to claim mental illness or some kind of depression and just walk free. Then the mayor of the city went on to say the following. As a former federal prosecutor and as an officer of the court, I acknowledge and respect our system of justice and the decisions that are made by our judicial officials. However, as the mayor of the city of Indianapolis, as the chief elected official to whom IMPD directly reports, as a father and as a member of this community, 
I am shocked and terribly disappointed in the decision of the court today. Well, clearly, officials are frustrated with Judge Stoner. Now, a petition was started to remove Judge Mark Stoner from the bench, and it had more than 1,600 signatures when Judge Stoner again rocked the prosecutor's office by not finding Dacia Lacey guilty for smothering her two-month-old child. It was an incredible April for Judge Stoner. Now, this is all still very new. I would expect the efforts to remove Judge Mark Stoner to increase. I'll be watching it. And I don't have much to remember baby Alana by, but we can remember Officer Leith. Brianne graduated from Southport High School in Indiana, where she was captain of the dance team. After graduating, she enlisted in the National Guard, She worked as a correctional officer in the Indiana Women's Prison, and then she joined the IMPD in 2018. She had served as an officer for two and a half years at the time of her murder. She was in a committed relationship with fellow officer Charles Parker when she died. And let's stay in Indiana where an alleged meth user turned herself into police without realizing she was turning herself into police. Okay, here's what's happened. 34-year-old Sarah Harris called 911 twice in January of this year to complain about the bad baggie of methamphetamine that she bought off her drug dealer. She had paid good money for those drugs and her dealer needed to be held accountable. Well, when police showed up at her home in the city of Bedford, Sarah willingly handed over the baggie and requested that the cops test the drugs to determine if her drug dealer had indeed sold her fake drugs. She complained to the police that when she ingested what she was calling bad meth, it left her feeling like she was going to have a heart attack. She also admitted to cops that she had felt weird after snorting a line of the bad meth, claiming she, quote, felt something different when it touched her skin and nostrils. Well, she told officers she had smoked a bowl of meth with a friend and that this experience was different than that experience, and she wanted the cops to go get that dealer. Cops noted in her affidavit that she was willing to admit to her drug usage if that meant they would go get the dealer for selling her bad meth. Okay, I know you're asking, was this her first go-round with law enforcement? The answer is no. This woman is seasoned. Yet, she still made the call turning herself in. Sarah has prior convictions for theft, for meth possession, criminal mischief, disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, and also for operating a vehicle while intoxicated. Sarah has been charged with meth possession, and that felony carries a maximum 30-month prison sentence. The charges against Sarah were filed last week. And this quick note, Morgan Wallen has finally broken his silence since he was arrested two weeks ago for throwing a chair off of the rooftop bar he was partying at. Okay, this was back on April 7th when the 30-year-old was charged with three felony counts by the Metro Nashville Police Department after a chair that he allegedly threw off the roof of the six-story Chief's Bar landed on Broadway near two police officers. Wallen spent three hours in custody that night before posting a $15,250 bond. And if you haven't had a chance to see Morgan Wallen's mugshot, it's a treasure. He is smiling broadly in the picture that was posted by the Metro Nashville PD on their ex account. Well, on Friday, Morgan said the following on his ex account. I didn't feel right publicly checking in until I made amends with some folks. I've touched base with Nashville law enforcement, my family, and the good people at Chief's Bar. I am not proud of my behavior, and I accept responsibility. He then told fans that he has the utmost respect for the officers working every day to keep people safe, and that in regard to his tour, there will be no changes. Wallen's tour kicked off on April 4th, and he is expected to be joined on that tour by Jelly Roll, Lainey Wilson, and John Party. And if you're a country fan, it appears Wallen is back in the saddle and ready to perform. All right, let's finish with this quick story. Back on October 5th, I told you the story on Rise and Crime of David and Trisha Cena, who had taken their family camping at Moreau Lake State Park in New York. Now, this was a normal activity for the family, a quick trip over their weekends to enjoy each other and friends. And during that trip, nine-year-old Charlotte, that's their daughter, well, she decided that she would take one loop on her bicycle around the campground alone, without her siblings and without her friends. 
When she hadn't returned after 15 minutes, her parents contacted authorities and the search for Charlotte ensued. It took two days, but investigators were able to track down her kidnapper, 47-year-old Craig Ross. Okay, see, Craig had left a ransom note and fingerprints on that note were tied to a 1999 DUI case that involved Craig Ross. When police surrounded the area where Ross was living, they found Charlotte hiding in a cabinet. Well, last week, Craig Ross was sentenced to 25 years to life for the kidnapping of Charlotte and then 22 additional years for the predatory sexual assault of a child. Now, the sentences will be served consecutively. During the sentencing, a statement was read that included remarks by Charlotte. She shared the impact on her life of the kidnapping and assault, and she also noted her very own bravery for surviving that ordeal. She ended the statement with these three words, with no fear. You keep living, Charlotte. Don't let any criminal take away your value or happiness. Well, that's your Monday episode of Rise in Crime. I have a couple of case suggestions that I'm researching and I'm hoping to bring to you on Thursday. So please keep sending those in to me. And also, will you please like and follow and subscribe and download on all of the various platforms. Five-star reviews are fantastic and helpful in the growth of Rise in Crime. I'll see you in Phoenix on Thursday if you're attending the live show for Murder With My Husband. You can join me again on that Thursday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules, and keep safe out there.